I'm Morgan Norwood, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. There is still more news ahead. Eyewitness News at 5 starts right now. Now, New York's number one news. Channel 7 Eyewitness News. A deadly boat crash on Fire Island. One boater killed, the other on the boat stranded for hours before help arrives. The latest on the rescue. And breaking news, the teen accused of killing O'Shea Sibley in the parking lot of a Brooklyn gas station indicted this afternoon and charged with second degree murder as a hate crime. Thousands of people trapped in Maui, desperately trying to get home as wildfires devastate the island. Tonight, we talk to people from our area who are still stuck on the island as the fire continues to march through our mayor neighborhoods. And a live look at the Empire State Building. Tonight it will be lit up in Eyewitness News Blue as we here at Channel 7 are celebrating 75 years on the air. And good evening at 5 o'clock. I'm Shade Better and Wong. I'm David Navarro. Bill Ritter has the night off. Sorry we couldn't show you the Empire State Building, but the clouds are hanging over the city. <laughs> yeah, Because we'll have more on those stories in a moment. But let's get to that AccuWeather alert. Storms moving through the tri-state right now. That's right. Those storms triggered a tornado warning earlier this afternoon in some counties in New Jersey and those warnings have now expired but these storms could still pack a punch. Meteorologist Danny Backstrom in for Lee tracking it all for us. Danny. Yeah David and Sade not just impacting visibility but impacting the evening commute. That is what we are worried about considering how heavy this rainfall is. Here's a look at the radar and I know it's a fairly isolated area now that's being impacted by the heaviest rain but unfortunately it's the metro area just ahead of the evening commute so it really could be a mess given how intense this rainfall is. Here is Manhattan. The reason you couldn't see that camera view is the rainfall intensity here. It looks like the boundary for the heaviest rain is about Harlem. So the majority of Manhattan under really heavy rainfall right now. Staten Island rainfall intensity starting to pick up, uh, starting to taper off as the intensity picks up for Brooklyn, for Queens, even moving into Nassau County. So the heaviest rain right over the five boroughs right now. Zooming out, looking at the rest of Long Island, complete rain coverage right now. The heaviest rain is the further west you are, but we're even starting to see that rainfall intensity pick up close to Fire Island and this will continue shifting north and east so that rainfall intensity for the rest of Long Island going to increase as well. For Monmouth County, for Ocean County, things are quieting down but back here, this is uh, in Burlington County, this is where we saw that reported funnel cloud earlier this afternoon that prompted the tornado warning in parts of Ocean County it was allowed to expire early but we're also seeing a thunderstorm wind damage report in this area so it's a good indication that yeah there was some strong weather moving through. It looks like the severe weather threat starting to taper off as our rain chances taper off from west to east as well. We're not through, not in the clear just yet, but it does look like as we move through the next three or four hours, we start to back off that rain chance. Right now, 70s, bit breezy, hard to see much of anything due to the rainfall, but give it a couple hours and once the sun sets, things will quiet down and looking much better for the weekend. I'll have the weekend forecast for you coming up in just a bit. Shut in, David. Okay, Danny, thank you. Now to a wild story on Long Island. A boat crashes into a home on the water, killing a boater and injuring another. And that injured boater knocked unconscious for hours. And when he came to, he managed to find a cell phone in the rubble and called 911. Eyewitness News reporter Kristen Thorne is in the newsroom with more on this developing story. Kristen? Sade, the survivor told police he and a friend were trying to get an early start to a fishing trip when they left Bayshore just before daybreak today. He ended up calling 911 around 7 7.30 this morning reporting his friend wasn't breathing and the boat was overturned. Newscopter 7 was over the scene this morning in a remote part of West Fire Island. Investigators say 47-year-old Christopher Canella, his two dogs, and a friend were out on the water before the sun came up. One of them, investigators aren't sure yet who, lost control of the boat. It went airborne, crashing, and then overturning into a home. Is that they were traveling in a uh, southerly direction through the... Uh, through the West Channel and uh, it appears that they failed to navigate the channel. Police say Canella may have been knocked unconscious. His friend was ejected from the boat and died. Miraculously, the dogs were okay. What happened next is a story of survival. Banged up and bruised, Canella went through the wreckage to find a phone to call 911. When we arrived, we found a vessel that was overturned that had gone about 30 plus feet onto the shoreline. For rescuers, getting to the scene was only half the battle. We were not able to get our boat or any of the other fire boats as well as the police or the Coast Guard near the scene because it was extremely shallow, treacherous waters. Firefighters say they had to get out of their boats and walk through the water. 
Obviously, it's in the middle of the Great South Bay. It's on an island, and the boat is lodged up against the house. Rescuers say no one was in the home at the time or in any of the several homes on the small island. Because it is such a remote area, firefighters had to get creative using a golf cart to take Canella to the mainland. And the dogs just followed right along suit. They didn't want to be away from him. So we then loaded him onto our fireboat to bring him onto shore, and his two dogs followed suit. Canella is recovering at the hospital. Police have not released the identity of the man who died. Back to you. Thank you, Kristen. We are following breaking news. A grand jury just handed up an indictment against a 17-year-old for the murder of O'Shea Sibley. The charge, second-degree murder as a hate crime. Sibley was killed last month outside a gas station in Brooklyn. Witnesses say the suspect made homophobic remarks before stabbing Sibley. Eyewitness News reporter Stefan Kim live in downtown Brooklyn with the latest on this story. Stefan. Well, David, 20 to 25 years in prison, that is what the 17-year-old is facing if convicted, indicted by a Brooklyn grand jury on second-degree murder, hate crime murder charges. Brooklyn DA Eric Gonzalez made the announcement moments ago stressing the importance of prosecuting this case as a hate crime. Investigators say on July 29th, he stabbed O'Shea Sibley at a gas station in Midwood after the gay professional dancer intervened between a group yelling homophobic slurs and anti-black slurs at another group. After initially de-escalating the situation, words were exchanged once again, and that's when investigators say the teen pulled a knife and stabbed Sibley. The teen suspect turned himself into cops late last week. This crime, while clearly impacting his family and loved ones, have impacted the entirety of Brooklyn and the entirety of the city, and I dare say the entire nation. His light was shut off, was killed, um, for senseless reasons, reasons that I think have to be addressed. This intolerance that we have in our country and in our city of people who are different than ourselves is something that we have to make sure can never stand in this city. Now, the teen is not being identified because he is a minor. He'll be arraigned tomorrow morning. Reporting live in downtown Brooklyn, Stefan Kim, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. Stefan, thank you. We have new information about the two apartment buildings that were condemned in Plainfield, New Jersey, forcing dozens of people to look for a new place to live. More than a year ago, the state sent the building's owners a list of violations. They were ordered to comply and to correct all of the violations, but it appears that never happened. And this week, the buildings were condemned. Condemned. Now the city has taken control and contractors are preparing to begin repairs. They came inside to check the water because we, um, our water is not functioning. We only have hot water for like three, four months already. The challenge now is getting some of the residents out to be able to do the work. Many have defied orders and stayed because they simply have no place to go. Many paying their respects as the body of New Jersey Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver now lying in state in Trenton. Trenton uh, Oliver's flag draped casket was carried into the Capitol Rotunda today by state troopers. She died last week while serving as acting governor because Phil Murphy was on vacation overseas. Oliver was the first black woman to be elected to a statewide office and the first black woman to serve as assembly speaker. All too often when people get in politics, they forget where they come from uh, and who they really are, but she never did, and I, and I found that to be one of her better qualities. Oliver's casket will lie in state tomorrow at the Essex County Courthouse, a memorial service set for Saturday. The FBI has launched an investigation into the deadly shooting of a man in Utah who allegedly threatened to kill the president and New York leaders. Agents say they went to the home of 75-year-old Craig Robertson yesterday to serve him warrants and that Robertson pointed a gun before he was shot and killed by officers. Authorities say Robertson displayed a pro-Trump agenda online and planned to attack President Biden. Biden, the vice president, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, and New York Attorney General Letitia James. The shooting happened hours before the president was scheduled to land in Utah. And former President Donald Trump and an aide both pleaded not guilty to the latest charges in the classified documents case. Trump waived his right to appear in court in person. His va valet, Walt Nada, entered his plea in a courtroom in Florida earlier. Meanwhile, Trump's property manager, Carlos Del Vera, was again unable to enter a plea because 
He still does not have an attorney. Both men face charges of conspiracy and making false statements to the FBI in connection with the accusations of mishandling classified documents. Meanwhile, special counsel Jack Smith is asking the courts to set a January 2nd date to start Trump's trial regarding his actions to overturn the 2020 election. In a filing today, Smith said the date would give Trump's legal team enough time to review evidence and prepare a defense. Trump's lawyers have one week to respond to the requests and propose their own date. And now to a special day here at Channel 7 as we are celebrating 75 years on the air. 75 years. Mayor Adams yeah. declaring today WABC Day in New York City. And tonight, the Empire State Building will be lit in Eyewitness News Blue. We could not be more proud, and it's quite an honor for all of us working for the most watched station in the nation. Eyewitness News reporter Kimberly Richardson live at the Empire State Building with more Kimberly. Hi, well, David and Sade, this is a miniature version. The real deal will turn that beautiful Eyewitness News Blue at 8.01 tonight. But first, the backstory. What was originally WJZ would eventually turn into WABC. August 1948, Harry Truman was in the White House and candid camera, it made its TV debut. At first an underdog, this news operation morphed into and remains a dominant force in this industry. Three, two, one. If you know, then you know. Mayor Eric Adams is well aware. Damn, there goes that eyewitness news fan again. <laughs> On this, the 75th anniversary of the station, the mayor declaring this WABC TV day. So I know you're doing your job, but you're allowing us to really uh, see what's great about the, the city over and over again. At the very beginning, Channel 7 was only on the air for a few hours. Along with the news, you'd see cartoons, westerns, game shows, even roller derby. Think of it as a diamond in the rough. In 1968, a defining moment, Al Primo reshaped how the news was structured, putting in place his signature eyewitness news format, which to this day sets us apart. Over the years, things change, but at its core, most important, W. ABC's commitment to keep you informed in good and bad times. As president and general manager Mary Lou Galvez put it, we don't just report on issues, we roll up our sleeves and do everything we can to support our viewers, generations who consider us family. This team has reported on some of the biggest stories in the city's history, from 9-11 attacks to the New York City blackouts and most recent, the COVID pandemic. These are just a few, and they have been there for it all. Oh, and the stories we have told. That was just the appetizer. The entree, in just about 20 minutes, our very own Bill Riddle will take you on a marvelous journey, show you how WABC TV came to be. For now, we're live in Midtown, Kimberly Richardson, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. Kimberly, thank you so much. And, you know, I can't emphasize enough all of the people behind the scenes yeah. the writers, the directors, the photographers, the electricians, the stagehands. Yeah. Uh, there's so many people behind behind the scenes that make Eyewitness News what it is today. So uh, we are just yeah. thrilled for everyone here. Eyewitness News team. Mm -hmm. So let's get back to what we do. I bring you the news. Still ahead on Eyewitness News at 5. Wildfires turn paradise into a hellish nightmare as they continue to rip through parts of Hawaii. We're talking to people from our area who are currently stuck in the middle of that devastation. And nearly a week after the riot in Union Square, the Twitch streamer whose giveaway fueled the chaos breaks his silence. And a federal judge considers the future of Rikers Island. The judge is ruling today as the federal government aims to take over the city-run jail. And as we celebrate 75 years on the air, here is a message from the president of the ABC-owned television stations. I'm Chad Matthews, president of the ABC-owned television stations, including WABC here in New York. We're celebrating 75 years of Channel 7. 75 years. Just incredible. And I'm incredibly proud of all the amazing work, dedication, and community commitments from our talented team that has led to this milestone anniversary. Prior to my current position as head of the station group, I held a number of leadership roles here at WABC. 
ABC. During that time, I witnessed the station leading the way during many historical events like the dark day of the September 11th terror attacks to the scary period of the COVID-19 pandemic where New York City was the nation's first epicenter. Eyewitness News has covered breaking news from every angle and provided important updates and life-saving information to our communities who've come to rely on Channel 7 as a trusted source and partner. This 75th anniversary is an amazing time for the station, and it has been an honor to be part of the journey. Congratulations on this huge success into the next 75 years. All those wildfires in Maui are fueled by high winds and officials on the ground say that weather conditions are slightly improving as they try to get the upper hand on these deadly wildfires. Right now we're seeing new images of the devastation caused by all of those fires. It's left 36 people dead and destroyed hundreds of structures. And now thousands are still trying to flee the flames. They've been left stranded at the airport and being told it might be days before they can leave. We had power out for about 36 hours at the resort we're at. Uh, hurricane winds, it was bad. We went for a walk. We kind of turned the corner and Lahaina was just on fire. Mm. As many at the airport still wait to be transported out, airlines are sending more empty planes to Maui to help with the evacuation efforts. And some of those travelers stranded at the airport trying to get out of Maui are from here in our area. Eyewitness News reporter Marco Sola spoke to them today about their desperate attempts to get home. It was very scary because, you know, there, there was a lot of smoke and we could see it right from the car and there was a whole highway of people who were also seeing that. This is video from that car with wildfires burning in the distance. It's where Kate Storms, her sister and parents spent the night. The family from Dobbs Ferry on vacation in Maui stuck on a closed highway, unable to get back to their hotel. So we were kind of in standstill traffic and circling for a little bit, trying to find if there was another way, but you know, we ended up kind of just being in that standstill traffic all night, pretty much. The storms eventually made it to a Walmart where they and locals have been picking up supplies. They slept a second night in the parking lot. We camped out next to um, a man yesterday who lived in Lahaina and lost his home. And it's so devastating. So we're here in Maui. Mike Demurgis is another New Yorker forced to make a getaway from his island getaway. With fires threatening their hotel, the Iona University professor and his family spent hours on a golf course parking lot. Demurgis says he didn't feel he was in immediate danger from the deadly flames, but the lack of cell service and being in unfamiliar surroundings have made things difficult. One option was they said there's one road you could take out of town. It's very tricky. It's very windy. It's very rough. You can't do it at night. So, yeah, it was an ominous feeling. Demurgis made it to a hotel on the northern part of Maui, able to celebrate his nephew's birthday, all the while realizing so many who live on the island are suffering. They were in tears as their family and friends had lost their homes in the area. And yet, a lot of them didn't have homes to go to, but were still showing up to work to feed the people and to help, help the people that were all the evacuees that were in the area. The storms hope to fly back to New York later today. The Murgis has a few more days before getting ready for the start of the new school year. Just two families returning from a vacation they'll never forget for reasons they could have never imagined. In New Rochelle, Marcus Solis, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. Okay, Danny, so we've been reporting that the winds are backing off. So yes. why is this happening now? The reason for it, it's been misconstrued a little bit. It's not a direct impact from Hurricane Dora. What, mm -hmm. is, what it is, is high pressure was set up north of the islands, mm -hmm. and Dora, hundreds and hundreds of miles to the south. But it's the squeezing of air between mm -hmm. those two things, and it speeds up, and that's why we saw gusts 50 to 60 miles yeah. per hour. But as Dora moves on, that pressure gradient weakens, and the winds will weaken as well. Oh, good. But it was the perfect storm between high wind and dry conditions. You don't think of Hawaii as a dry place, but Maui actually seeing abnormally dry to moderate drought conditions. So that was another problem that exacerbated the issue. Dry condition. Do you have something to say? No, I was going to say the Empire State Building back here at home, the Empire State yeah. Building. Are we going to be able to see it through all of these clouds? You know, know. It's be lit up. Of in course, when we light it blue, yeah. the clouds come in. If <laughs> anyone <laughs> needs dry conditions right now, it is us. But no, this is what we're looking at right now. I do think by 801, visibility should improve because the worst of the rain is, is past, and that will allow 
allow these low clouds to lift and cross in our fingers. We'll actually be able to see the Empire State Building tonight. 72 right now, still dealing with some rain in this area, but the intensity is starting to back off, and you can clearly see we're starting to shift the mess of moisture a little further east. Zooming back into the five boroughs where we saw the most widespread rain, you can see that intensity is starting to back off a bit. We're not in the clear. Staten Island seems to be drying out, but Manhattan's still seeing light to moderate rain. It looks like Brooklyn, Queens, same story with the pockets of heavier stuff now shifting into parts of Nassau County and a little further north. It looks like Yonkers seeing some heavy rain right now. So Nassau into Suffolk County, that's where we're seeing the heavier rain for Long Island, but we have widespread showers even over through the Hamptons in Montauk. A little further south, this is where the wettest weather was earlier this afternoon. Some drier air pushing in now. Things are quieting down for Monmouth and Ocean County, but still some scattered storms and, and scattered showers in general for central and north Jersey. I-80 picking up some rain. I-78 picking up some rain. So th the highly traveled areas, especially this time of day, still going to be slick. You're still going to have a little ponding on the roadways due to how heavy the rain was an hour or so ago, but we're not adding a whole lot more to that the further west that you are. For northern suburbs, scattered showers, still some heavier pockets, but not all that widespread. As we zoom out, you can spread. As as we zoom out, you can see the clearing that's off to our west, so give it another couple of hours. We'll time this out. This is a high-resolution forecast model, so this is the very latest data, data that we have, and it does show that by 6, 7, 8 o'clock, we're clearing. This is 8. This is uh, Manhattan right here in the middle, and it does look like visibility should be improved. Still some cloud cover, but not nearly as uh, wet out there as what we're seeing right now. But it takes us until 9, 10, 11 o'clock for the east end of Long Island to clear out. From there, we are clearing out even the cloud cover, and by the time we wake up tomorrow morning, sunshine because not just the rain that's drying out tonight, it's the air as well. Wind direction right now still out of the south. Wind direction tomorrow noticeably breezy, but out of the west-northwest. So those dew points will be dropping and everything working together to make tomorrow a much better day. But for the next few hours, we're still dealing with the wet weather. Give yourself extra time to get where you're going this evening. But you see the rain chances taper off, the cloud cover clears out, and looking much better overnight. Our lows are in the 60s. Our highs tomorrow in the mid-80s with lower humidity and a breeze. Should be a beautiful finish to the work week if you're heading out on the boat tomorrow. Looking at waves one to three feet with a breeze. Tomorrow night, clear and comfortable. No weather worries for Friday plans at all. Saturday, just a few spot storms, but in general, not a washout this weekend at all. So make it through the AccuWeather Alert this evening, and we uh, are smooth sailing for a few days. Okay, right. we need it. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks, Danny. Uh, still ahead on Eyewitness News at 5, the latest on the investigation into the murder of Tupac Shakur. Brand new body cam video reveals what investigators are doing to solve the case. And and it could be great news for the thousands of New Yorkers enrolled in SNAP. Details on the popular grocery delivery service now accepting SNAP benefits. This Eyewitness News AccuWeather forecast is sponsored by Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury law firm. New at 5, presidential... candidate in Ecuador was shot and killed at a political rally in the capital. Ecuador's president suggested organized crime is behind yesterday's assassination of Fernando Villavincenzi. Video on social media appeared to show the candidate walking out of a rally surrounded by guards. For the footage then shows the candidate getting into a white pickup truck before gunshots are heard. The deadly shooting came less than two weeks before the country's presidential election. Well, ABC News has obtained new body cam video of the search of a Las Vegas home in connection to the murder of Tupac Sh Shakur. Uh, the video shows a SWAT team raiding a Las Vegas home of Dwayne Keith Davis. Davis claims to be one of the two living eyewitnesses to Tupac's murder. Who are you looking for? Me and everybody else. We're going to bring everybody else out of the house. So just me and my wife. wife. Just you and your wife? Just looking for me. Is there anybody else inside the house? Just me and my wife. Well, Davis not only claims he was there, he says he was in the front seat and the shooter was in the back seat. Police sees magazines, computers, hard drives, and pictures in last month's raid that apparently show people who may have also been connected to the murder. New at 5, Instacart has started accepting orders from the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, better known as SNAP. The online grocery services people on the government program can now place orders from 10,000 stores. Until now, the company was only allowing 
uh, accepting SNAP benefits in Alaska under a test program. More than 42 million Americans are enrolled in SNAP. And still to come on Eyewitness News at 5, Rikers could be placed under federal control. Today, a federal monitor spoke up on conditions inside the facility, and we'll tell you what they had to say. And just about a week since the riot at Union Square Park, the man behind the mayhem is speaking out. Plus, celebrating 50 years of greatness, we're going to dive deep into the career of hip-hop legend Heavy D. Welcome back to Eyewitness News at 5 o'clock on this AccuWeather Alert Day. Wet weather moving across the tri-state right now, but starting to see some of that clearing from west to east. Want to give you a quick radar tour. I know this is really impacting that evening commute, and you're going to see a lot of slick spots on the roadways and some spots, maybe some localized flooding, some ponding for the poor drainage areas. The heaviest rain now east of New York City, but we're not in the clear just yet. We're still seeing a few scattered showers off to our west. Long Island seeing the most consistent coverage of rain. Starting to see hints of drying for Brooklyn, but from Queens over through Nassau and the entire of Suffolk County, moderate to a heavy rainfall falling. Now, north of New York City, it's a little more scattered. West, same story. And then for South Jersey, things are starting to calm down finally. We're not completely in the clear yet, though, with that at times heavy rain complicating the commute. In general, we're expecting rainfall totals from a half and an inch of an inch to an inch, and we have seen that, and that could produce flooding, especially for poor drainage areas. But moving into tonight, clearing, and tomorrow, much better. I think you'll like the weekend forecast. I'll have that for you in just a few minutes. David and Shade. Okay, great. We're following breaking news. A federal judge has approved the first step in the process to place Rikers under federal control. The judge citing violent and unacceptable conditions inside the facility. The ruling was made. This is not the end of the saga between the city and federal authorities when it comes to who will run the prison. Eyewitness News reporter Tom Nergevan live in Lower Manhattan with more. Tom. David, a lot of tension in that courtroom today. The judge, though, saying she will hear arguments on this, and that is the first step toward federal control of Rikers Island, a step she says has to be taken for the safety of inmates and the people who work there. Seven inmates have died at Rikers this year. There were eight stabbings just last month. A big crowd of protesters outside the courthouse in Lower Manhattan. They say Rikers Island is simply too far gone for reform. They want it closed. What I want the administration to do is stop viewing this as an attack. What I want you to do is view this as a way out to make everything better. In court today, the monitor appointed to oversee the notorious jail made it clear conditions could hardly be worse. And Judge Laura Taylor Swain agreed, calling the current state of affairs tragic and unacceptable. The city comptroller says since January of 2022, at least 26 inmates have died in custody at the city's jails. But at Rikers Corrections Commissioner Lou Molina told the court things are significantly better than at the apex of this crisis, and that, he said, is undeniable. Their words that follow a visit to the jail this week by the mostly conservative members of City Council's Common Sense Caucus. Rikers Island, they say, is improving rapidly under the current administration. All my colleagues screaming about closing Rikers, where are you going to put the individuals? What is the monitor there to do? Let the commissioner do his job, let our mayor do his job. Comments that anger these activists, aware that there were four recent stabbings at the jail over the span of four days. It does make me really mad. The reason why is because people are dying. Every single human being deserves a right to live. So a major step toward receivership for Rikers, but the judge stressed today it is not unavoidable. She suggests the city use the intervening time between court dates to show a real commitment to transparency and reform. That gives them until the end of November. Live in Lower Manhattan, Tom Negevin, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. Tom, thank you. But well, we are celebrating 50 years of hip hop on Eyewitness News, and the Bronx is the birthplace of hip hop, but Westchester County is also home to many legendary artists. It's where Sean Diddy Combs got his first break. Acclaimed producer Pete Rock mastered his craft in Mount Vernon. The common thread, the late Dwight Arrington Myers, AKA Heavy D. Eyewitness News reporter Kimberly Richardson talked with his mom about everything from his life to the legacy he leaves behind. Hands down, when it comes to hip-hop, he put Mount Vernon on the map. 
Dwight Arrington Myers, better known as Heavy D. His younger cousin, <laughs> legendary producer, DJ, and rapper Peter Phillips, a.k.a. Pete Rock, who as a teenager... I snuck down in the basement of Hev's house and turned on the equipment, and Floyd came downstairs and caught me and then taught me. Dwight's older brother, Floyd. This is a story about family, its influence on each and every decision Dwight made as an artist. He said, Mom, do you think I could really face you and my dad if they're listening to me on the radio or anything and I'm using profanity? And November 8, 2011, when Mrs. Meyer's youngest child died, he was just 44 years old. In the morning, you speak to your child, and within four hours, he's gone. From their home in Mount Vernon, the matriarch of this proud Jamaican-American family tells me about the very beginning when a then 17-year-old Dwight told her he wanted to be a rapper. I said, I'm going to give you one year, and if you make it, I will be supportive. But if you don't make it, I want you to make me a promise that you're going back to college. Done deal. Within six months, Andre Harrell ended up in my house asking me to sign the paper. Harrell started his label, Uptown Records. Heavy D and the Boys was first to sign. What followed? Late nights in the studio and a certain neighbor who idolized Heavy. Dwight loved him, though, but he said, you're getting to be a pain in the neck, you know that. So he went to Andre and he said, do me a favor, just hire Puff. Sean Diddy Combs. Heavy always made sure his lyrics were family-friendly is one reason why artists like Michael and Janet Jackson worked with him. But he was well aware the industry was changing. More expletives in songs. He said, no, I'm, I'm never going to be like that. I can't do it, Mom. Dwight focused on acting, raising his daughter. But in 2011, a return to the stage in what would be his last performance at the BET Hip Hop Awards. Today, Mrs. Myers holds on to words of wisdom she instilled in her family, lessons that made Dwight the person he was. We've always taught our children, show kindness and be respectful. It will take you a long way. Kim Burley Richardson, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. What a legacy he leaves mm -hmm. behind. And we invite you to join us tomorrow for our half-hour special, 50 Years of Hip Hop, The Bronx and Beyond. We're going to look at how hip hop is woven into so many aspects of our lives and how New York has been at the center, center of it all. That's tomorrow at 530, right here on Channel 7. A still coming eyewitness is to five, a social media influencer speaking out nearly a week after a riot broke out in Union Square. What are you saying about his fans as police continue to make arrests? And just when it seems everyone is getting sick again, a new warning from doctors all over the country. The medicines, they say, that are in short supply as we approach what could be another flu season. Social media influencer. Mr. Kai Sinat is speaking out nearly a week after that riot broke out in Union Square Park. In his first public statement since the chaos, Sinat said on Twitch live stream that he intended for the event to be a safe and fun giveaway and that he is disappointed in some of his fans. I don't condone any of the things that went on that day. None of that is cool. I'm seeing random videos of people getting sturdy on people's cars. And I've always and I'm asking myself while I'm watching the video. Why? Like, why? He goes on to say, uh, being from New York, it has always been his dream to give back to the community. He now faces charges of inciting a riot, and the police are still looking to make more arrests. The U.S. is still experiencing massive medication shortages, and it's having serious effects on patient care. A new survey from the University of Utah Drug Information Service shows there were 309 active medication shortages in the second quarter of the year. That's the most in nearly a decade. About one a third of healthcare system pharmacists say they have been forced to ration, delay, or even cancel treatments or procedures. Hundreds of people turned out on Long Island to raise money to fight breast cancer and support people and families impacted by it. The American Cancer Society kicked off its Making Strides Against Breast Cancer season. Female breast cancer is the most common type of cancer in the entire world. In the United States, the average woman has a 13% chance of developing breast cancer in her lifetime. As of 2023, there are over 3 million breast cancer survivors in the USA today. That's 99%.
percent of women diagnosed with breast cancer that will survive in the U.S. today. And this is largely in part due to what you do every day, but also because it's of screening and detection. Our very own Shante Lands, MC to kick off on Long Island, WABC TV is a proud sponsor of the Making Strides Walk. And still to come on Eyewitness News, the severe weather threat is tapering off, but we're still not in the clear. Meteorologist Danny Beckstrom is timing out the rain and looking ahead to the weekend. Look how clear the Empire State Building was just there. I'm very happy because <laughs> tonight is the night that it is set to glow in beautiful Eyewitness News yes. blue to celebrate our 75th birthday. And speaking of which, our dear friend mm -hmm. and longtime co-anchor Diana Williams had this message on our anniversary. Happy 75th anniversary to WABC. I am so proud to say that of those 75 years, I was here for 29 of them, working with some of the best, brightest, most wonderful journalists on television. It's a great place to be, and it's still all about the people and all about our viewers and what we do every day to serve them. And the people who work here work so hard at doing it. I'm retired now, but I miss it. I miss the people. And I miss our viewers. So happy, happy anniversary to WABC TV. Welcome back. An AccuWeather Alert evening with heavy rain moving through, but just how we like it. We can finally see the Empire State Building. Again, all, all eyes will be on the uh, Empire State Building as we move toward 8 o'clock. Very special day for us here at Eyewitness News. 71 right now, but what you're more focused on, the radar. Still awfully busy out there, although the core of this heavy rain starting to shift east of New York City. We're not in the clear just yet. We're still seeing scattered showers move through Staten Island, about to get another round. Mostly dry for Brooklyn and parts of uh, Queens, it looks like dry, but Manhattan Manhattan filling back in with the rain. We're also seeing that just west of New York City. For Long Island, this is where we're seeing the most widespread rainfall and the heaviest rainfall. Parts of Nassau into Suffolk County picking up that rainfall intensity. And you see even out east, we're seeing steady rain. North of New York City, scattered showers with pockets of heavy rain. And that's what we're seeing for North Jersey as well, although it's not nearly as widespread as what we saw just a couple hours ago. Still watching this line that could fill back in and impact parts of Monmouth and Ocean County in the next few hours but in general drying off to our west and that's the trend that we see overnight into tomorrow morning. This is our high resolution rapid refresh model. It's the latest information that we have and it does show that as we head toward seven or eight o'clock, we're starting to see the majority of this east of New York City. Still a little unsettled, still could have a few scattered showers and you're seeing that north uh, where pop-up showers are still possible. But approaching about midnight tonight is when we expect the radar to finally settle down. Of course, the further east you live, the longer it takes for those showers to uh, exit, but even the drier air moves in overnight into tomorrow morning. So the cloud cover clears, our storm chances back off dramatically. We're not expecting rain tomorrow and the humidity drops. So we're not in the clear just yet. We continue with the wet weather for the next couple of hours. And keep in mind, with the heavy rain that has fallen so far today, still looking at the possibilities for some ponding on roadways, especially for poor drainage areas. So could be slick out there on the roads. Please keep that in mind. But we taper off the rain chance and cloud cover very quickly. Our lows dropping to the 60s into tomorrow morning. Our highs tomorrow, fantastic. So today, kind of a speed bump, but it delivers a really nice weekend with sunshine, breezy but lower humi humidity tomorrow with highs near the seasonal average. Even your Friday night looks fantastic. Clear and comfortable, 60s in the suburbs, but you notice that wind direction shift. That's what brings in more humidity for Saturday. Both Saturday and Sunday looking seasonable. We're talking mid 80s, a little bit more humid, and I put the thunderstorm mic on there so you know there's the possibility of a pop-up shower, but it's fairly isolated and, and most of us stay dry. So a great weekend ahead of us. You just got to get through the wet weather this evening. David? All right, Danny, thanks. You know, as we have been saying in all our newscasts today, we are at Channel 7 celebrating 75 years on the air. It's a remarkable anniversary. And along the way, so many of you have grown up getting Sade. The David. list goes on and on. <laughs> and we're all so proud to be a part of a legacy. Sade. The David. list goes on and on. <laughs> and we're all so proud to be a part of a legacy of dedicated journalists serving you, our viewer. Here is our very own Bill Ritter with a look back at how we came to become the number one station in the country.
This is Eyewitness News with Roger Grimsby, Bill Butel. Good evening, I'm Roger Grimsby. Here now the news. Before Roger Grimsby and Bill Butel and the groundbreaking Eyewitness News format, Channel 7 was, well, it was very different. First branded WJZ and then WABC. And it was back then that it felt a little bit like the little engine that could. If you turn on Channel 7, you would see cartoons and westerns, talent and game shows, even roller derby. But all that changed in 1968 when a visionary by the name of Al Primo brought his Eyewitness News brand to New York and WABC. We weren't going to just preach the news to people. We wanted to go out and talk to the people because, you know, people can tell their stories better than we can write them. It was a little different open approach, actually, where the personalities of the people on the newscast were able to shine through. But that made us more friendly and made us more accessible. We were really sincere at what we were doing. And it was to deliver news to all segments of New York. We were like the community we were reporting to. And I mean that we were black, brown, white, tan, Latino, Asian. Where was this in journalism at that time? This was remarkable. Now, while people were taking note, it was an investigation by Geraldo Rivera that really changed things, that put WABC on the map. Geraldo took us inside Willowbrook on Staten Island, a facility that turned out to be a warehouse for people with disabilities. What we need is a new approach. It was a phenomenon. In many ways, it affected my life as much as it did the residents of the institution. This is Eyewitness News. While the set designs improved, and while the technology got better, no more handwriting the forecast. Normally we get up to 39 degrees. We're hoping for a nice pool weekend, nice beach weekend. I'll give you both. It looks fantastic. Our mission has remained the same. Informing people across the tri-state of the stories and issues that matter the most in an unbiased manner. And the World Trade Tower has just collapsed. It just pushed that fire. It spread that fire to, to uh, several other buildings. Here in New York City, lots of anger following the decision by the Supreme Court. The people who made WABC TV and Eyewitness News must see TV were not alone in becoming familiar images to the biggest TV market in the nation. There's that news van again. Yep, the Eyewitness News van became a kind of rock star unto itself. But at its core, always, Eyewitness News reflected the people it served, and being part of the community was central to our mission. That's why we have long-running campaigns like our effort to bring fire safety and breast cancer awareness to viewers. Breast cancer mortality rates have declined. It's why we have shows tailored directly to certain audiences, like Tiempo, Here and Now, which began as Like It Is, and Up Close. And it's why we air so many of New York City's most important and colorful parades, as well as the New York City Marathon. All right, Ernie at the Garden. Of course, for many, Channel 7 is not just about news or news programming. It's also the station synonymous for so very long with Oprah Winfrey. And we're still the home for General Hospital, Jeopardy, and Wheel of Fortune. For the New York Lottery, I'm Yolanda Vega. It's also the station that had Yolanda Vega reading the lottery numbers at night. Remember her? The station that aired a late afternoon movie. And in the morning, it was the station that had Regis Philbin. You know what it is to leave your car keys in your car in New York City overnight? <laughs> That's stupid. We became sort of the... the it started as a locally produced talk show at WABC. We still produce it, but now... As it has been for decades, it's been syndicated across the nation. Good morning. So here's to the next 75 years of bringing you the news as the number one station in the country. Happy 75th anniversary, WABC. Happy 75th anniversary to WABC. Happy 75th anniversary, Eyewitness News. I'm very happy to celebrate the 75th anniversary of Eyewitness News. Thank you, WABC, for all the memories, and congratulations. Happy 75th anniversary. WABC TV. You are out of this world. I'm Bill Butel. Thank you very much for being with us this evening. Good luck and be well. So many great memories there. What an incredible look back and so many great moments and memories from the last 75 years. You know, and as Shade just mentioned moments ago, there are so many people behind the scenes that have contributed to the station's success. We want to thank all of them mm -hmm. and we want to thank all of you, the viewers, for 75 years of support, loyalty and encouragement. Eyewitness News at 6 is next, but we want to leave you with a message from our station's president. 
Happy 75th anniversary to Channel 7. I'm Mary Lou Galvez, President and General Manager of WABC. I am so incredibly proud to have been part of the WABC family for more than 20 years, having worked in various roles with the best in the business. WABC is a very special place, and our commitment to the communities that we serve every single day is our number one priority and has been for 75 years. With our pioneering Eyewitness News format, we have set the standard for television journalism for decades, and we continue to evolve and bring the news to you, wherever you are, across our growing platforms. A very special thank you to you, our viewers, who have been with us through this journey.